let me do this talk. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm Jack Radcliffe. I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Pretoria. And as you may guess by my accent, I'm originally from near Manchester. So in the talk today, I'm going to talk about um, teaching radio interferometry. Um, and I've been trying to be careful to not steal uh, Melvin's thunder, who's going to talk about the, the whole DARA project. So this is going to be a, uh, it's key to, to note that this is going to be a DARA focused um, talk, but I will briefly talk at the end about um, other programs to teach interferometry. So this is my outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to basically say, okay, why, why do we need people who can do interferometry in, in Africa? And for those people who are not radio astronomers, we will, uh, you will find out if you are radio astronomers, you can probably go to sleep for the next 10 minutes. And then I'm going to give a very brief um, overview of the DARA project, which um, I'm, I've been involved in since 2015. Um, and Melvin will give a, a very nice in-depth talk about this project um, in the next talk. So we're pretty complimentary to each other. And then I'm going to talk about one part of DARA that we do, which is uh, teaching interferometry. And I'm going to put this in the context of um, being able to use these open source materials to supplement your courses, help teach your students, but also um, build up this, this infrastructure of, of, of students across the continent to be able to utilize um, these radio interferometers. So why do we want to teach interferometry? Well, it's pretty straightforward. The, the big, big driver is the upcoming SKA, but we've also got Meerkat at the moment. And for those here who aren't radio astronomers, uh, you should know about the SKA otherwise. Um, it's a global consortium of 14 separate countries with eight African partners, um, and it represents almost 40% of the world's population. And as you know, this site is going to be located in South Africa, where we are now, and Australia, where we're going to have SKA Mid in, in South Africa. And then we're going to have where there's going to be thousands of dishes like these, this kind of hexagonal shape on the left. And then we're going to have millions of low frequency antennas that are going to be scattered over Australia. So that's the first driver. We want to get the, the, the groups here in South Africa and in the SK partner countries in Africa to be able to utilize, run, and you know, make the next generation of these discoveries. And the key thing about the SK is it's going to revolutionize our understanding of many, many different science topics. So going all the way from general relativity to cosmology to galaxy evolution. Um, but also nearby planets and molecules in the search for extraterrestrial life. So some people will say, and some people may dispute this, that their SKA has basically some of the, the biggest science uh, potential of any instrument that's ever been made. So it's crucial that we, we have the people who can exploit this data and be able to um, get these new science results. And here's just an example from the SKA precursor, his Meerkat. Um, and this kind of shows the near and far. And my research is generally on extragalactic objects. So these, all of these blobs in the left-hand side is, is from the MITEI survey. And each one of those blobs is um, a galaxy. And you can see there's um, active galactic nuclei present with their, with their jets, but also lots of contributions to star formation. And then we shift into the nearby, uh, our own galaxy. And we see this beautiful image um, from Hayward et al, which was featured in Nature. So in these giant radio bubbles that were produced um, possibly by the central black hole or winds from there. And these weird kind of synchrotron emission and H2 regions located in our own galaxy. So it's this sort of data that we're going to get to the SK, but to another magnitude in, in, in scale. It's also not just the SKA that, that's going to be here, it's also going to be the, the proposed African VLBI network. And there's, this has been in the works for a long time, but partner countries are possibly refurbishing some dishes. So Ghana already has an operational dish at C-band, which are going to be formed together to create the African VLBI network. And the SKA is going to only have certain resolutions. So we need to, if we want to have higher resolution and, and look inside these galaxies, we're going to need the African VLBI network. The other key thing is, is that there's a large gap in radio telescope coverage. So for those who are radio telescope aficionados, you know that the more telescopes you have, the better the image quality you get. Um, and the AVM will fill this gap where we've currently got these huge baselines to, to Harder Beisuch, near where I am right now but nothing in between and the AVM will do this. And so 
here's an example of this. And for those who aren't a uh, radio interferometry guru, essentially, if the plot on the right has more gray points, it's going to create a better image. So this is a simulation of um, Emelin in the UK plus the EVM, which is the telescope I just showed. And we've added Meerkat in there as well. And this is for an equatorial source. And then if we include the African VLBI network in here, we get a much improved um, filled UV coverage. So your images are going to be better. And everyone from all astronomers, all observational astronomers at least, should know what a point spread function is. And you can see that our point spread function is now more well behaved, so more Gaussian. And, and for radio interferometry, um, this is good because it means that we're going to have a much more well behaved image and a much better image quality when we come out the other end. And the key thing about this as well is that we need to have both interferometry, interferometry experts that can use Meerkat, but also VLBI interferometry experts, because SKA phase two will be basically unify these two arrays. So sometime at the end of this um, decade or the next decade, depending on when it's going to be done, this the SKA will expand with huge long baselines over thousands of kilometers uh, crossing South Africa and the sub-Saharan African countries. And this will link the AVN to the SKA to provide this extra high angular resolution. So given this, we can see now that we need to build research groups. We need to have engineers to be able to build, utilize, get the data, make these amazing discoveries. And luckily this has already been happening in place. And one of these projects, and I'm just saying this is one of the projects, is the DARA project. And this is meant to, to kind of bridge the gap. And Melvin is going to talk about this next. So I'm going to skip very quickly through this. Um, and it's a joint UK um, South Africa with now EU support. Um, and it's a human capital development project to try and provide training in the eight African partner countries. And this has been going since January 2015, and it's about to end in 2021. And, and Melvin will will tell you more about the amazing stuff that the Dara that has come out of Dara over the last um, seven years, almost. Should be March 2022. Sorry, keep on forgetting. It's still 2020 in my head. And so these are our, our partner institutions that are, are being used here. And, and the goal of Dara is that we, you know, you. You get your students learning about radio astronomy and interferometry, and then they can start going back and building their own groups um, at these universities. And they've got the, the research experience and the know-how to then utilize the SKA when it comes along. And so these are, are just some of the um, universities that have been that have been reached out with DARA. And to be able to transfer all this knowledge, we have basic training and an advanced training um, where we have MSTs and PhDs, but Melvin will talk more about that. And what I'm going to talk about today is basically mostly about the basic training. So this is um, comprises of an astrophysics unit. Um, so I've got some pictures of the left. There's Peter Wilkinson from Manchester. Um, I think this is in the first iteration. And then we have an on-site technical and observational training. And then we have the final unit, which um, myself and Rob Bezik um, generally coordinated, and that's the interferometry unit. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. I don't encroach onto Melvin's talk far too much. So unit four, the, the interferometry unit, is and was designed to take the student from the data that you get at your telescope all the way to science-ready images. So to conduct this, we put together a blend of lectures and workshops, a blend of lectures blended together, I said that twice. Um, we put together a blend of workshops and lectures um, for students to follow and, and be able to, to be able to produce this. So we go from this uncalibrated data, any radio interferometry aficionado will, will know that this is the, the band pass of the telescope, so the sensitivity over uh, frequency, basically all the way up to seeing this, this beautiful image of 3C345, which is a, a fluffy AGN jet um, where the blood, supermassive black hole is, is pumping out these, these plasma balls um, at relativistic speeds. So that's what they try and do. And originally, Unit 4 was delivered by, by tutorials and, and workshops where we go in person. So that's me when I was a lot younger and less gray. Um, 
And the VLBI data reduction was done using our radio interferometry tool called CASA. And then the computers were provided by, by Dara or Soraya in South Africa. And as you can see, we were normally delivered in person, but the push to the COVID <laughs> pandemic um, has made us transition to go into virtual and hybrid um, solution. And so this kind of showed us, well, we learn a lot from this and in, in how we get people who may not have good access to, to internet. And we, we found out that, you know, for this to work, we really do need the in-person sort of um, mechanisms because people's internet aren't great at home. So we take them all to a central location, their local institution. And the, the great thing about this is this is 2020, 2021. So Dara was going on for five years. And we, we have students who had previously done DARA who go back to now assist. So this is part of this sort of self-sustaining um, part, which, which we really wanted to push by the end of this. We don't want all the, the virtual experts who or the people experts going out there from Europe to remain there. We want to get that, that kind of capacity development built up. And in this case, we supplemented this by virtual lectures from a, a range of experts and Q&A sessions, which every day. And the key thing about this is we approach this with some form of hybrid learning. So this is multi-platform delivery where we have local talks and discussions. We've got Slack platforms, platforms for questions and videos plus the written tutorials. And the key thing about this is this has created a lot of material. So we have created the, the Dara website, um, which uh, I, helped, I helped build a few years ago. And this is kind of a dynamic and multimedia course with guided tutorials. So if you have a student, they can go to the Dara website. I do this for my own students and learn how to do interferometry. And so I was going to have a, I don't know how much time I've got left because I've got a clock on here. Um, I was going to quickly just show you the website and then go back to my slides and then I'll finish off. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, you have six. You have six minutes left. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Just five minutes of uh, discussion, and of course. Okay, perfect. I'll be well done with them. So everyone can see my screen still. So this is the Dara website. So you can just what, jot this down. And in Unit Four, we we have all of the lectures. So here we've got um, lectures which are covered by YouTube videos. So these are various different people um, across the world have been giving YouTube videos. And these basically supplement and follow the various tutorials that we have. So you can go onto here, you can take them, you can go through them, you can give them to your students. We, I do this as well. And the key thing about all of this material, so this is just one of the tutorials where it goes step by step, easy. So for any beginner can, can pick this up and go. They, there's installation instructions and it's and it's all self-contained. So this allows you to basically um, be able to, to become a, a VLBI aficionado if you, if you want to. And the key thing about all of this is that we are covering not just uh, standard, bog standard continuum emission, but we also do a bit of spectral line data and a bit of advanced imaging and calibration. So as I said, um, the final few slides that I'm going to talk about is, is how this material can help you. Um, and the key thing of all of this is the materials are open source. They're copyright free. Um, if you use them, I'd love to know. Um, I put together tutorials, so, so it'd be good to know who's using them. But they're also designed to be self-contained. So students can go home even if they're, they're still virtual because of, I know some new COVID variant comes along. Um, and they can go and learn interferometry. The other thing that they're, that they're useful for is um, if you have access, there's, uh, your, there's slides there that you could adapt to your own course. And this Dara website and these materials have now been used as an official CASA guide. So this is the, the data reduction um, package, which the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in um, the US um, makes. And that is now an official CASA guide. But also these materials have been adopted for, for interferometry schools. So for example, the European Radio Interferometry School in 2019, I've used this as an honors elective course to teach interferometry. And so honors students then go and do their masters and they've already got this basis of, of understanding. But also you can use this as, as for postgrad students in this um, plot up here, uh, plot. This, uh, this web page up here just shows the, the VLBI tutorials on the CASA webpage. 
So just as an aside, it's not all about Dara and it's not, we're not the only people who provide all of this. And I wanted to just highlight what Soraya and the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory has, has brought out. And they have this e-learning portal on the, on the right. And this contains lots and lots more information on interferometry. And this includes, um, it typically focuses on, on Meerkat side, but many of the techniques that are there are applicable to, to all other versions of interferometry. Um, the other thing as well um, is there's the African Radio Interferometry Winter School as well, which is a, a week-long workshop, but all of those materials are also freely available on the, the GitHub here. So I'm probably under time, which is good. Um, the conclusions of my talk is basically there is a need for interferometry experts all over the African continent due to the upcoming Meerkat, SKA, African VLBR network. Um, but we also need to ensure that we've still got the Dara-esque HCD programs. So we've got Dara and Dara spin-offs and things like this, um, such as Dara Big Data. Um, and these are essential to continue to be able to achieve this. And I think some of the self-sustainingness of, of, of what Dara has brought in is, is ripe for this to be successful. But the key thing or the legacy of, of, of the Unit 4 of Dara is that we've now provided a, a nice repository of materials to be able to help with this effort. Lots and lots of tutorials, lots and lots of uh, information so that someone can just go and pick up and learn interferometry and then create these and make these amazing new discoveries um, going forward. So thank you very much. And if I've got any questions then that would be great. We open the floor to questions uh, here live or I mean the physical people who are here or on chat. So I let me see in the chat if there's any question right now. But this is already a question from here. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, really, it is uh, very important for the development of astronomy further in Africa. Um, what about uh, your uh, plan in the future to develop, of course, more of infrastructure development for the astronomy across Africa? Um, for example, uh, to the northeast part and also to the west, still uh, there are lacking of uh, these uh, uh, telescopes for the uh, infrastructure development. I have communicated to, uh, one of uh, the uh, DARA or MSK uh, program, but uh, no one has communicated with this through uh, David uh, that I have communicated. So please, uh, uh, what do you have uh, on this uh, in the future to collaborate? Of course, I'm from Ethiopia, from one of uh, the Indigenous universities in Germany. Sure. Um, well, I'm, this is probably actually a better question for Melvin in the next. Um, and then that's talk. So I'm I'm only a, a low a lowly guy in, in Dara. So I think we'll need, uh, build these collaborations. So Melvin's probably better um, suited to answer this. Actually, sorry to jump on you, Melvin. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how you managed to hear the question because I, I found it very quiet and I couldn't really hear. I'm afraid from the room. Yeah. Or maybe I, I think, relay it. I think they were, if, if I get this right, please do correct me, because um, it was quiet for me and now everyone's on thousand decibels. Um, I think it was regarding um, how we're going to expand Dara uh, or expand some, some similar programs to target, I think, did you say the North Africa area, region or something like this? I, I didn't catch all of it. What I'm saying is that um, how do you expand to other parts of Africa this program and also how do you collaborate with other universities across Africa, that is the point. I mean, I can address that now if you like, uh, or we can wait till after my talk. Um, I mean, at the moment, we're, we don't have any more funding to expand in any direction. So that will be the first uh, hurdle we have to come over uh, is, is where we're going to find uh, new funding. Um, but we're certainly keen to expand to uh, you know, other countries that have an interest in um, 
in radio astronomy, you know, certainly a big interest, Nigeria, Algeria, uh, Egypt, uh, countries like this that are, are not currently SKA partner countries. Um, I had, as you, some of you are aware, I had a previous uh, GCRF funded proposal where uh, people from both countries were rep well represented and, and good ideas about potentially converting telescopes or developing new telescopes came out of that. Uh, but again, you know, this still requires uh, us together collectively to, to build new partnerships and try and win funding uh, in, in the future. So that's not going to be easy, uh, but we're certainly aware of the desire. Uh, is that possible to get uh, uh, your um, communication email, please? It'll be on my first slide. Mm. Yeah, All right, thank you. Yes, please go ahead, Sean. Yes. Um, Just don't get close to us. All right. Um, that was a good presentation. Thank you. I just have a question. Um, from one of your slides, it looks like um, there is a school, like probably summer school or so, where you have people trained to understand you know, how to use the code and all of those um, lessons. Do you hope to continue this in the next future and include um, a more of a master's student from every other part of Africa, you know, so that you can have all part of Africa represented, like North, East, and all of that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question, thanks. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, again, it depends on, on external funding and what's available. Um, I'm not sure for the African Radio Interferometry School, because I'm not involved, so you'd have to talk to, I think, James Tuboese for, um, at NWU. I think he's giving a talk later on in this week. Um, for the European Radio Interferometry School, I am involved with that. And sometimes there is some uh, travel support for students, which they can apply to. And, and people from who may be disadvantaged or not have a, a big travel pot will be prioritized for that. So the European Radio Interferometry School is in September this year, if I remember rightly, I'm just checking the date. Um, and so you can direct, and that's open for, for students uh, or anyone that wants to learn interferometry, basically. So um, there is some travel support. It's not extensive because I think everyone's got a hit from COVID. Um, but, and that's in person in Dwingalo in the Netherlands, and that would cover travel and everything like that. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. And we are going to close now the, the, your, your talk with another close of applause. If, uh, we will move to the next speaker, which is Meldren, who has, who has already sneaked in and helped uh, uh, Jacques add uh, with some comments. So go ahead, help, uh, my, uh, Meldren. So you have uh, your 20 minutes plus five minutes, 20 for your talk and five minutes for the discussion. Um, just go ahead. Okay, I thought according to the program, I had 15 minutes for the talk. Sorry, and sorry, sorry. I, I, sorry again, I, I will correct myself. Uh, Jack had 25 minutes, you have only 15 minutes, that is 10 plus five. 10 minutes for the talk and five minutes for the discussion. Good, because that's what I planned for. Yeah, yeah. I thought that's what Jack had as well. But anyway, <laughs> You're up, you've upgraded Jack. <laughs> okay, can everyone see my slides okay? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, if you're asking for my contact details, then there's my email address at the bottom left. Uh, the main Dara uh, website uh, is also here. Um, so I'm Melvin Hoare, I'm from the University of Leeds, and um, you know, Jack's already uh, brought in quite a lot about the Dara project, so I'll, I'll skip over the duplicate bits and we can have maybe more time for discussion uh, afterwards. So again, you've, you've seen some of this already, uh, in fact, I think the funding is up to about uh, five million pounds worth now over the last uh, sort of seven years. Um, but as we've alluded to, uh, the funding is coming to an end. So literally the, the last part of the sort of main DARA training is literally taking place in Ghana as we speak. Um, um, a lot of match resources coming in from uh, DSI in, in South Africa. So the, this was a bilateral project between the UK and South Africa. But um, delivering to the uh, you know to the eight SKA uh, partner countries. So uh, just looking at um, 
I mean, Jack nicely showed the, the partners institutions we had in Africa. So let me just highlight the uh, institutions that were delivering the training. So uh, we had uh, six different universities uh, in the UK and uh, several different universities uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, as well as the main uh, South African partner being uh, uh, Soreo. And, and uh, as Jack alluded to, we also had some EU funding uh, from the so-called Jumping Jive uh, project as well. But another big aspect to, uh, uh, to DARA uh, was uh, that we have industrial partners uh, on board. Uh, so in the UK, uh, this took the form of a, of a small company called Goonhilly Earth Station Limited, uh, which uh, basically owned, took over and owned this uh, ex-British telecom site uh, down in the far southwest uh, in Cornwall uh, in the UK. Uh, and you can see that there are uh, three big uh, dishes on the site here. And we had been interested in working together with this company for a long time, because just like in Ghana, we wanted to convert uh, the big dishes into radio telescopes. And the one uh, highlighted here uh, has recently seen, now finally seen first light as a radio telescope. Uh, so this is a 29 meter uh, diameter telescope with a brand new state of the art, basically an SK band five type receiver on it. Um, we also um, partnered with SANSA, the South African National Space Agency, to again uh, bring in this idea of uh, how the space industry links with the skills and technologies of radio astronomy. Uh, and of course, we've also uh, had the OAD on board uh, from the start uh, to help us uh, with the uh, funding uh, development projects, small development projects as we've gone along. So just to outline uh, I get a little bit more about how the basic training program uh, worked. So in each of these eight countries or thereabouts, then we were recruiting about uh, 10 young people per year uh, from each country. Uh, they, uh, all the recruits would have a good first degree in physics or related subjects. So sometimes that was more like sort of engineering or electronics or computing, uh, even maths. Um, and so we would recruit those people. So this was more like a sort of taster course or a transition course, if you like, a conversion course into, into radio astronomy. And it was usually delivered in sort of two week bursts, uh, four of them spread out over, over a year with experts initially flying out from the UK and coming in from South Africa and the rest of Europe, even, even the rest of the world. Um, in the last couple of years, obviously we've had to switch to a hybrid model where most of the material has now been uh, sort of recorded lectures by the sort of external experts uh, and we're delivering that uh, virtually. Uh, and then working with, uh, you know, having live workshops, Q and A sessions, uh, but also working with uh, a new generation of uh, you know, local tutors on the ground uh, who can help uh, there with the workshop. Everyone's still okay? Um, so the, the kind of teaching that we were doing, so we would introduce people to astrophysics, especially obviously a lot of them had no previous knowledge of astrophysics at all. Um, and so that, that was the first part. And then uh, delivering this technical training. Uh, so at radio astronomy observatories. So initially this was focused at Hartrow uh, in South Africa. So you can see on the top right here. But more recently, these pictures are from the recent training that have now been taking place at the new, uh, newly converted radio astronomy observatory in, in Ghana. And Dara has been providing uh, quite a lot of, you know, simple equipment, electronics equipment, so that people can get hands-on experience and learn for themselves with, with hands-on uh, experience of uh, how sort of radio astronomy instrumentation works and, and really learning from the bottom up uh, of, of how it works. Uh, but at the same time, they were getting uh, hands-on experience with the big telescopes, so the 26 meter at, at Hartrow. Uh, and here you can see on the left-hand side, some of the students uh, recently in, in Ghana, uh, actually during observing sessions with the 32 meter telescope there, uh, you can spot just about the maser line, uh, methanol maser lines coming in. So they're observing methanol masers um, in, in small groups and, and really getting to understand how the observational process worked. And as you just heard from uh, Jack, they also learned about uh, reducing uh, VLBI data. 
uh, on computers that were provided by a combination of Dara and Soreo. Another key part of the course was uh, training in computer skills. So before you can really get to grips with uh, sort of CASA and doing the data reduction training that Jack talked about, then uh, you know you needed an introduction to Linux and, and Python. So uh, this was provided by CHBC from South Africa, who delivered their uh, introduction to Linux and Python uh, two-week courses as well. And at the end of the a year's training, we would bring everyone together. So when we were going uh, full ball, then uh, we would have you know sixty students uh, from around the different. Uh, countries all coming together in uh, South Africa um, for a networking meeting. So we want to we want to really build this sort of pan African network of young people who are interested not only in the radio astronomy. Not all of these people are going to become radio astronomers uh, by any means. You know, maybe uh, between one and ten percent of them, perhaps. Um, and so uh, here is where we were um, illustrating how the skills in radio astronomy can be applied to other areas. So you could carry on into research, but also you know, looking at uh, how to take those skills into the industrial sphere, especially into the, into the space sector, um, how you might use your astronomy skills for development projects, for outreach. Uh, we would give careers advice with CV workshops. We've got a business advisor advising people on how to start up their own businesses using these skills and inspiration, and obviously bringing everyone together. So that was what we call the basic training program. We also have advanced training where we're uh, funding uh, PhDs and masters. Uh, so we've, over the years, we've now uh, done nine PhDs and 26 master's students uh, sort of in the UK, South Africa and, and, and elsewhere in Africa. Uh, so on the left, this was the very first cohort. And in fact, uh, rather uh, perplexingly, uh, Naomi and Willis, uh, are literally giving talks as we speak in the parallel session on the science session, uh, which I would like to be at, but I'm here talking to you instead. Um, and so, but you know, this is great. It's showing that the progress that, um, you know, uh, Willis is now permanent position back in Kenya, uh, similarly with Naomi back in Ghana. And so uh, continue building their science careers now. And here, more recent cohort, uh, down at the Goon Hilly Earth Station, uh, talking to the CEO Ian Jones, and uh, you know, really learning how 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 the sort of satcoms world works and how you can make money. So this was a big part of the yes. scheme that we had for the Newton Fund. We had to demonstrate how an astronomy project, a radio astronomy project, could lead to jobs and economic development. And this kind of summarizes that whole process uh, that we hope to to demonstrate and, and to continue um, you know a lot of uh, the reason for doing outreach obviously is to bring young people and get them interested uh, we've also supplied some of these uh, small uh, optical telescopes to get to get young people interested in astronomy this is a session in, in Maputo um, and um, that will bring people into the STEM area get them interested in the idea of astronomy we've got this whole fantastic project with the SKA coming to South Africa and so then as they get older, get them into the high tech skills in radio astronomy and technology, and then out the other end, some will become radio astronomers, but others will you know, join hopefully the, the fourth industrial revolution. They've got the skills in, in data handling, uh, big data skills, uh, you know, computing skills, uh, and know how to translate that into sort of other areas like remote sensing so that you can use sort of uh, environmental engineering and those kind of fields as well. So where we'd like to go in the future is to sort of build out, um, you know, this is together with Carla Sharp's uh, vision from, from Soreo as well on the Africa program, is to sort of have this co-location idea where you've, you've got some center of radio astronomy. So like in Ghana, we've already got the, the dish there, um, but in future it could be, you know, a new SKA dish starting to form a hub. You could build out from that to, to have a satellite business where you're looking at either low earth orbit satellites or even use the big dish for deep space uh, contracts. You've got often in these old ground stations, you've got uh, a lot of building space that can be used for data centers. Um, and then if you put that together with skilled people, especially in the area of uh, machine learning AI uh, and multi-wavelength analysis, which is very common in astronomy, this is what, this is our bread and butter, then you can apply those same skills uh, to other areas such as uh, 
you know, remote sensing data. So looking at environmental challenges, food, energy, agriculture, water, all of those kind of areas, climate change. Um, so giving people the skills and the inspiration through radio astronomy, but allowing them to then look at new startups, new businesses, creating jobs to solve real development challenges uh, in Africa is, is the vision going forward. So how do we get there now that the Dara, current Dara funding is running out? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot going on, of course, on the, on the outreach side, not least from uh, all the wonderful work that AFAS is doing in the run-up to the 2024 GA. But we need to find some new funding. Uh, so I literally was just updating this slide in the last 10 minutes because there may be, I was going to be rather pessimistic that there may not be any more UK funding coming forward because of the cuts in the aid budget here. Um, but there is a new fund coming, so let's see what happens. Um, but we may be looking more wider afield at the European sort of uh, development funding. Obviously, there's Horizon Europe for more research funding like doctoral networks. Um, but we may also need to look at business partnerships linking up with uh, industry uh, to provide funding or going to philanthropic uh, sources to, to realize this, this dream. Okay, so just in summary, then, uh, you know, Dara has delivered this basic training now as we come to the end of uh, the current round of Dara funding, but uh, to over 300 young people and, and uh, well over 30 people have got uh, their uh, master's and PhD training. Um, we've given a lot of help and business advice uh, to people uh, looking to start up their own businesses uh, through collaboration with the OAD, then we funded some development projects for, for various groups in various countries. And we're working with, with Carla now on this idea of uh, co-location in, in the space sector hubs. So we would like to continue uh, to keep DARA going. Obviously, we've got this big body of online material now, so that can be rolled out. We need to tidy it up a bit and, and get it a bit more professional, I think, and then it'll be ready to, to be used uh, more widely. And as the question just now asked then you know we would like to expand to other countries if we can um, with future partnerships and future funding bits so I will uh, stop there uh, so we have uh, two three more minutes for discussion uh, question the first one is coming from this room here Charles has a question go ahead yeah uh, Malcolm uh, I think it was a very great talk uh, I mean, it's Charles here, but I think it was, it was a very great talk. I think we've, 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 we've spoken a few times that on some potential collaboration between DARA and 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 APHIS, and, and particularly in light even of the question that was asked earlier, what 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 is the what what is the goal in expanding to to even other African countries beyond beyond those uh, beyond those 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 those, those, those oh. SK but yeah beyond oh. beyond, beyond those SK partner countries. And 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 if there are resources available, I think that it will be something that 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 APHIS would, would definitely be, be willing uh, to collaborate on with sure. with yeah with with with, with Dara, um, going forward and, and 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 even looking at at the EU call that's that that that, 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 that you're currently also target it could be something that we could maybe put in a proposal even together on uh, um, to, to to basically extend this even to other African countries beyond those those those, those SK partner countries. Yeah, was that was that Prospery or who was that? Oh, uh, Charles. Sorry. Charles. Oh, Charles. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it was difficult to hear. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Please get in touch. Um, you know, if you've got uh, a particular EU call in mind, then you know, let us know um, because it's uh, there are a lot of calls, but trying to find. The right sort of one is 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 quite difficult, uh, and and the EU funding is, you know, not easy to get. That's for sure. So, but let's let's try um, everything we can. That's for sure. Okay, certainly we can try uh, because there's new opportunities which have opened up recently with the EU uh, EU thing. So we can export it. So explore it further. Yes, I see one uh, um, hand raised. In fact, that will be the, the last question from Prosperi. Go, go ahead, Prosperi. Thank you, Jama. Uh, thank you, Melvin, for the nice presentation. Uh, this really has been a good program for the SK partner countries. Uh, I do only have one concern. Uh, at the moment, I think there's quite a number of uh, candidates that have been trained. 
but we haven't uh, put in place a means to put them together so that they continue sharing and uh, using the knowledge that they have acquired. So I don't know if there's anything in place. Yes, uh, thanks. Yes. I should have mentioned that. Um, so we've, we started last year um, what we call the Adara Forum, uh, which is basically where, well, we started off with kind of all the advanced trainees, um, both from, you know, uh, the Dara project, Dara Big Data, but also some of the PhDs and postdocs from the AVN partner countries in, um, in South Africa as well, to try and um, continue this kind of networking activity uh, going forward. And so, you know, we very much want, um, you know, the African trainees that have been through the program, the, the more senior ones to, to take up the reins there and, and drive this forward uh, themselves. We're happy to help wherever we can, uh, but, you know, um, I think it it needs to, it needs to be um, you know the African radio astronomers bring bringing forward their own ideas now on on how to push forward in, in all these different areas and, and and also starting to to lead the bids uh, for the funding uh, as well especially if we're going to the AU for funding um, I mean I've I've tried looking at some of the AU programs and I'd be very interested to try and work with people on on how we might be able to unlock any AU uh, research funding in the future as well or training funding. Uh, I think Jamal is very familiar with that, so uh, it'd be good to work together on that. I think. Good. So thank you again, Melvin, for your talk and your your, your answers to questions. So we can just uh, thanks him again. To Thank you very much. The next speaker, we have almost no, we have 10 minutes or 11 minutes delay with respect to the program. If people are following the program, so just add 11 minutes to the time which is there. So the next uh, speaker is Bonaventure Okere from the Center for Basic Science in Nigeria. We'll be talking about the PASIA experience. So go ahead, uh, Bonaventure. 10 minutes for your talk, five minutes for the dis discussion. No, you are mute. You are mute. You are mute, uh, Bonaventure. Okay, am I unmuted now? No, that's great. Okay. Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Are the presenters of uh, the last uh, the last presenters, especially uh, especially the talk by Jack and the Mervin. I'm happy uh, the progress they're making with the interferometry program and the Dara. Yeah, this afternoon uh, from Nigeria here, I just want to share our experience uh, with uh, yeah, my experience with you people on the efforts we are also making. I think all of us are partners in progress with what Mer uh, Mervin and Jax, all of them are planning to do and they are doing. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to give you an overview of uh, uh, PASI and how we, come up, how we came about that. Uh, the idea of uh, having a special summer school for uh, West African students was initiated in Beijing, China in 2012 through the AU conference when some of us, I've seen the pictures there, Melvin, I mean, uh, Kate, Mike Reed, and my very self, Linda, James, Ram, and IK, we had a meeting. How can we help African students participate in summer schools in Canada? Then, after discussions, we realized that the best to, in order to make, help many African students to participate, we had to bring the summer school to Africa instead of finding one or two people to go to Canada and uh, be involved in summer schools. So that's what gave the idea of this. And the first edition took place in 2013 after a series of meetings and it was held in Abuja, Nigeria. And uh, as I said, initially, the school was known as West African International Summer School for Young Astronomers, mostly for undergraduate students and teachers. But uh, this edition had been held in 2013, 2015, 2017. And the last edition was 
2019 in Nigeria, 2017 was in Accra, Ghana. And uh, due to the interest of African students, so uh, the YC, as you normally usually know it, uh, we decided to expand it and make it a Pan-African, because making it a West African mix looks as if it needed to West Africa. Since we're having more Africans to get interested in the summer school, we now have to expand it to other African uh, students. The last edition we had in 2019 had about uh, 25 women and 25 men, the quarter from the host country and other 16 countries share the remaining, some one, some two. Uh, that's how it has started. That's why we named it Pan-African to make it a purely African program. Uh, this school is being coordinated by three directors, uh, my friend Linda and July. July is uh, a research fellow, postdoc research fellow at in uh, Australia, while Linda is associate, um, uh, associate of an American Association of Physics. So these are three of us are pioneering this, though we have much more able men too. And we have a team instructor drawn from across the world. We have from Africa, we have from Europe, we have from Australia, we have from Canada. Uh, a major, majority of these instructors came from Africa. It's kind of like we want to build a, a, a summer school that being handled by Africans and for Africans who understand Africa in collaboration with foreign uh, uh, um, instructors who also volunteer because nobody being paid for this work, they volunteer to do, to do this work. So, and um, what could be the vision of this? Now, when we initiated the YCR, our main aim, which we carried along to other Af African countries, is to build critical mass of astronomers across Africa. That's just our vision. Uh, we agree with me that Africa now is a it's becoming the home of astronomy. A lot of instruments coming up in Africa, Southern Africa, radio, optical, Ethiopia, Ghana, Burkina Faso coming up and other countries likewise. So we need people that with this instrument that are coming up in Africa. Also, apart from building critical mass, we're also using the Pasir to uh, build a community uh, among African scientists. So we're building a community where they can interact, meet, share ideas, and uh, think of the way forward. Also, how to, I mean, it, it, it's a way to actually help these students to also interact with their colleagues af, af from outside Africa. So we are doing all these things to see how we can do the vision. Now, how is the structure of PASI? I'm going to give an overview of that. Now, PASI uh, is went to two week a program. It's a two week program. The first week is a program that. Uh, uh, we have to organize have a workshop for instructors because during that week there'll be exchange of ideas in terms of teaching design interactive session because the program is very interactive, it's an interactive program. And then we apply this issue of inquiry-based method as produced from some our partners from Canada, Linda in particular, and her colleagues. So we also need the prior to how organized outreach in schools within the hosting country. Then the week two is the school proper. Within the week two, um, we have the week two first phase part of it, I mean, session one of it for undergraduates. And they're involved in the inquiry lab, distance measurements, design the universe measurement, interactive peer taught lessons, and the uh, design of outreach uh, activity to bring to home community so that these students, after attending the summer school too, they will go home, they carry what they learn to their own home country and then see a way to encourage their career base, to give them career talks and let them realize that whichever area of STM you are involved, you can actually make use of it. It can be useful to, for uh, astronomy research. And then the second phase of the postgraduate stream, I mean, for the summer school, is the postgraduate stream, where postgraduate students, most likely those already who have a big interest in astronomy study, whether up school or radio or high energy, any part of astronomy, they are introduced to, to Unix and Python. And then, um, hold on, this thing is blocking my vision. Okay, whoa, sorry. Okay, so all the data reduction, we teach them there. Also, they participate in real time observations. The last time we did, we have the, some of the postgraduate students have real time observations using the 
the list of a telescope on with the link online and do the time observations, do data reduction, and then begin to know whether they're actually progressing in their careers. Now, what makes Pasi different, a bit different from other summer schools? Uh, like we have the ECR and uh, even the Dara one is mostly for radio astronomy and other schools people have been organized in different countries. Uh, we have uh, is international long-term collaboration. Since we started in 2013, our collaboration has remained intact from across the globe. And then our unique inquiry-based curriculum, which makes the school more practical oriented and then the army community uh, so on and follow up. So that's what makes it unique. Now, the international long-term collaboration, how have we been doing? The overall goals of this is driven by African scientists, not foreigners. Like we said, majority of the instructors for this school are Africans. So we want to see how Africans and foreigners can work together and sustain this tempo. So it's a long-term program. So if we come to any country, we build more instructors so that even if the foreign uh, collaboration uh, collaborators, because of the engagement, they can no longer continue. The African instructor can continue the vision. So it, the team is made up of mostly uh, today from Africa and water from outside. They currently we have from Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, Gabon, and Zambia is going to be included very soon. Uh, even Northern African Algeria, Jamal, our president is also interested, and some people from uh, Kenya are also getting interested. So we're building a team for Africa. And then we have some teams from Canada, Australia, and those, some people from Europe too. Now team members participate for multiple years. Most of them have been there since inception. And since then it has never reduced. The temple has been there. So, and we also discovered that the lot of them is make sure that the alumni are returning to as instructors. Some of them are coming back to become instructors after their postgraduate programs. They come back to be part of the team, share their experiences, and then, I just said, the collaborative teaching is what is very unique. We have pair teaching. We have two instructors take up a topic, design the uh, uh, outline, and then, as we can see it in this, the collaborative teaching at Paris is very, very, very instructive. We have two instructors, one from Africa, one from outside Africa, sit together, design uh, their, their course outline, how they're going to do the programs. And that just how this is, is not just a normal, formal, classroom teaching is all interactive. So the peer teaching uh, is very unique to us here. And it's not been happening like that, but I find it very, very interesting uh, to the extent that uh, Kim Baudo, who is here sharing this partnership with Linda, has applied the query-based methods in teaching fees at University of Nigeria and Soka. And they are giving a testament that the team has been working for him and for his lessons. A med student gets more interested in his course. All right, so another one is uh, the inquiry-based curriculum. How is this very unique? It increases scientific thinking among the students. Here, it is a, a system that makes students begin by asking questions. They ask questions, they generate questions, uh, develop models to help to address these questions. Uh, I remember one of the sessions, a instructor asked the students, uh, is it possible to plant uh, uh, potato in on planet Mars. It gave them a lot of, a lot to think about. Solutions came up, and they were able to design method how you can plant something on planet Mars. Just developing that kind of thing. Then information communication, but much reasoning. That's what these particular methods help the students to do, and it's have been very wonderful. The feelings you see at the end, some of the students will will, will start feeling. Well, so all these concepts in science that we cannot understand, we can each actually bring solution to this concept by ourselves. They discover the solution to concepts, and some of them start saying that they are for the for the first that feel like scientists. Now, yeah, we said in the good day teaching, just learn science in ways that mirror authentic scientific research practices, and that's what we're based. So it's an activity that you can see. Sometimes we get models of the planets, give them distance. Some of them look at this as I think in how to measure the distances and try to solve this problem. If you're on ground at a distance away from planet Saturn that's hanging there, how do you get a distance from the edge of the planet? It gives them something to think about. And uh, when you, this, is this type of models, 
They choose their own questions and they try to answer these questions. It gives them an idea how to answer. And at the end, everybody will together uh, sit down together and look at the solutions and see how these things are achieved. And this one scenario of one of the experiences the students had, uh, this student, three of them, Mary Queen, Jane, and Esther, they figured out the distance to the moon using a lunar quotation or regulus. So they, it, it excites them when they feel that they could actually find a solution to all these things. They never knew they could be able to measure the distance by themselves. Without, without being taught orally, this is this a way to mathematically alone without practicing it. So one of them said, this method made me realize that I can think and find answer to questions on my own without a smile. I cannot say I can think like a scientist. These are expressions when they, they do that. Another unique thing about Pasi, the Alton community, we don't just- Sorry, uh, I'm not sure. It's really yeah, two yeah. minutes. If you want to have some questions, Air to you, there's two minutes left for the overall talk. So yeah, I'm always uh, trying to have, I have one slide, one or two slides more. Yeah. So we got to encourage the community. We have a WhatsApp group for the alumni. And uh, we also have a mentorship program that has been published since 2017, following up as a the women, the gender discussion is always be part of what we are doing. We always evaluate our programs to know whether it's actually making impact on our participants or not. So we have been using the class where of where of measuring question, the introductory astronomy questionnaire, and the perspective on teaching and learning survey to actually analyze the students' experience and to know whether we should continue doing that. And now look at this. This shows you at the end of 2019, we've come after analysis, we came up with this. Most of them have said that 70 percent of Pasi say, I mean, of the students say Pasi influences how they teach their students' number in their thousands, and we keep growing. It all really creates outreach activities. So, and uh, most of them, 40% involved in STEM studies. And then that's just what we have been discovering. Yeah, we said that instructors also bring in to their regular teaching to encourage them. This part of the analysis is a summary of uh, the influence of uh, PASI on our students. That slide shows that. And then, like one of the students says, he said, Pasi opens the mind to bigger pictures of what they know. And our results complete. The next Pasi is coming in Zambia. Let me just round up with that. And it's going to be in Livingston, Zambia. So we are calling everyone to come and collaborate. We have been having people sponsoring us. So thank you very much. And you're welcome to be part of us. Thank you very much. Bonne aventure. Okay, so it remains minus one minute for the question and answer. So obviously we are going to thank you again right away and go, go to the next speaker. And if anybody has a question, I don't see any question for the chat or here, they can just ask it on the chat. Okay, so again, we thank Bonne Aventure. And we don't go very far. We are still with the, with the Center for Basic Space Science with the NEMECA. So Nemeka, you are online, I believe. So go ahead, uh, tell us more about what you people are doing at the center. Yeah. And you have 10 minutes plus five minutes for the answers and questions. I think they have to call the center because they started late. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay, so my presentation is on Center for Basic Space Science, a rendezvous for astronomy research in Nigeria. So these are my outline. Now, uh, quickly, Center for Basic Space Science was established in 2001 with uh, Emeritus Professor Pionel Kek as the pioneer director, who also happened to be uh, one of the persons that established AFAS. Now, we have the following mandate to develop manpower in space science and astronomy, drive uh, economic development of the nation using uh, 
indigenous uh, space science and astronomy technology, develop, uh, be a leading light in astronomy and astrophysics research, and then finally design, patent, and fabricate uh, space science technology equipment. Now, this is where we are located. This is our new observatory complex, and um, we also have an uninterrupted power supply at the complex. So we have three main focus research areas. We have astronomy, planetary science, and uh, instrument development. Now, astronomy being the study of the universe and um, the formation of the universe, uh, we, are, we go into metrology, motion of celestial bodies, and what have you. Now, let's have a, a look at an overview of astronomy development globally. Now, you who believe, we will agree with me that the countries in green, highlighted in green, are developed astronomically. Now, these countries that are developed in astronomy are also developed in terms of economically. Now, if you look at our home, which is Africa, you find out that Africa is less developed and also economically, Africa is also less developed. So there is a need to, for us to develop our astronomy research, for us also to be within the League of Developed Nations. Now, at CBSS, we have this uh, thematic astronomy research areas. Uh, we do a solar drift scan observation. We look at the hydrogen mapping of the Milky Way galaxy. We also do moon sighting studies, detect uh, radio pulsar, using the DPS technology, and a whole lot of them, star formation, stellar evolution. These research areas are currently ongoing at CBSS. Now, we use some of these equipments, three meter or two radio telescope, three element radio interferometer for radio astronomy research and education. And this um, three element radio interferometer was basically designed by CBSS scientists and engineers. Now, also, we have the 25CM Miedi tele optical telescope, and the long solar is there, up and running. Then the radio Joe, which we also incorporated as part of our um, research equipment, is also there. Now, at the planetary science section, we do uh, air quality modeling, we study solar flares solar flares in relation to ozone. We also do solar flare impact on a gas giant planets. Now, having done all this, there's also a need to bring down this research. How does it affect human being on a day-to-day -day basis? We, we are also into organ research. We also do meteor, uh, meteorite analysis and near-earth object observation. As we go on, you see the practical example of our organ research. Now, further to this, at the planetary science section, we also divided it into three areas. We have the environmental and life science, and also we have um, recently we created the planetary geology in under planetary science research, which are all have their own uh, research areas. Now. The meteorites, uh, some meteorite samples we collected, we are able to do analysis on them. And then we are running further analysis on them by May this year. We take those samples back to University of Wits in South Africa to do further analysis on what we couldn't do here in Nigeria. We already secured a collaboration with uh, Professor Roger Gibson there to conduct the research. Now on the organ accumulator research, if you look at these two, this is a practical example of how we can apply astronomy on a day-to-day -day living. Now, these crops here on, on this side, we are charged, sorry, the seedlings we are charged using the organ accumulator and we try to compare the yield of both plants. You find out that these are, these two, uh, the maize we are planted at the same time, but you find out that the ones charged with organ has better yield than the ones uh, charged without organ. The growing, the one with organ grows faster than the one without organ, and the yield was far better. Now, we, when we talk about astronomy, we also look at how does it affect our daily lives. 
Now we established a 3D printing lab with a um, laser cutting machine and a, a CNC machine for etching. For us to develop uh, equipment that we need and also for the need of the general public. Now, so using these equipment, we are able to design, have our own uh, high precision GPS receivers and um, environmental monitor and gas leakage detectors. We also have intrusion alert system and a high precision uh, range finder. Now, all these equipments you see here, uh, we are designed by scientists and engineers at the center using the knowledge acquired through astronomy. Most of them uh, uses the principle of telemetry. I think all of them use the principle of telemetry. Now, on this, on this one, we designed um, an automated irrigation system. This irrigation system is mounted, is solar powered. You mount it in the farm, uh, give it instruction on what to do. Maybe if you want it to water your farm by 9 a.m., if you start watering the farm by 9 a.m., give you, send you a feedback on the soil content of the farm, the soil moisture, and also other environmental um, characteristics like the temperature of the environment. And then uh, you, you can operate it manually, you can operate it via text message, but the key thing there is, it's autonomous, it's remote. You also have your own console, you can check on your own to see the environmental characteristics. We also designed an um, environmental pollution and monitoring system. Um, this particular system uh, is different from other systems because it measures about 13 uh, environmental parameters. And the beauty of it is that you can stay wherever you are and um, using the uh, handheld console to check the situation of things in the field without being there. So it's up and running at the center. And then here, this is the security intrusion alert system. Now you can see this flower vase here. This is not just a flower vase, it's a security system we design. You keep it in your office, it will record the sound. Currently, we have incorporated the video to it. So any intrusion in your office, it will send you a, an SMS or it will call you and you start listening to what is happening in your office. So wherever you are, you can monitor what is happening right there in your office. So I think, okay, this one here is a three axis magnetometer, which we also designed in the office for a client. And also one is also up and running in the office. On this side is the console, which you can always use to maybe query the, the magnetometer in the field. And this equipment is also patented. The uh, irrigation system, the magnetometer, they are all patented equipments. Now, our three axis solar tracker, for um, uh, if you mount your solar panel, I mean, you go to sleep, it will be following the sun and for you to get the maximum energy from the sun. Now, this one here is a, a rover we designed. It's a payload, it's up and running. Uh, it's solar powered. You can deploy it in the field, put in your payloads, what you want it to to monitor a metal detector or whatever you put on it. Now, this is the console. You can drive it from a distance or you, it's autonomous. It's, uh, it has sensors that can um, avoid uh, obstacles, avoid ditches and what have you. Now, if you put a, a metal detector here, it will do the job for you. So this payload is up and running. It also has a video. Now, in your office, you can stay in your office and view what the uh, machine is doing in the field. So it's currently running, though we are improving on the versions, on the version, this is the version two we have here. So we are improving it on it to make it, um, to put more payloads on it, making the version three. Now, on our indigenous development, we try designing our own radio telescope. This is a 10, a 10 meter radio dish we are building at the center. It has gone beyond this stage it is now. Um, the receiver system is already there now. 
So you can use it to at least do some basic astronomy research now. Now, currently, um, we have a, at inception, we have one PhD holder. Now, by 2021, have an nine PhD holders at the center, 25 master's degree holders, nine PhD in view, 10 uh, MSc in view, and over 150 BSc holders. So we are making a great progress in terms of also human capital development. Now, we are not left out in outreach. Outreach is an integral part of what we do at the center. We have an outreach timetable that we visit schools, two schools every month. Every two weeks, we go out on outreach on various topics in astronomy, quality light training, universe in the box, and hands on basic space science workshop. We also go to communities to establish astronomy club. This is an astronomy club we establish in a community in Southwestern Nigeria. So we normally go there every year. We've been there three times since we established the astronomy clubs. And also we welcome students in our center on excursion and outreach. So we are always busy at every point in time, either with students coming or we are going out to spread the gospel of astronomy. Okay, so these are outreach we've been, okay. One of our unique outreach activities was at the maximum security prison uh, in Enugu State. This uh, project was uh, funded by OAD. We visited the, uh, the maximum security prison in Enugu and uh, in Soka, where we took the gospel of um, pale, blue, uh, pale blue dots. The concept of pale blue dots, we took it to them and um, to help rearrange them on the ways to shun crimes and see each and every one of us as partners in progress, progress in the project act. And also we, after the project, we had to establish some skills acquisition centers for them. Did like the Yeah, you I'm rounding up. You have still you two, two minutes from uh, including the time for question and answers. You have, uh... Okay, so let me run through. So we also have a mobile planetarium for our outreach enhancement. Okay, uh, Okere has, uh, Dr. Bonaventure has talked about the West African Summer School. Now we have ongoing collaboration, the E-Road uh, implementation of Erasmus Mundus Mobility. We are collaborating with them, the Papsin Mobility, Vasco Citizen Science with, with the University of uh, uh, Stockholm. I, British, uh, our partner is here with us. And um, also the Kemras, uh, Kedish Institute of Applied Mathematics and uh, Astronomy of the Russian Academy of Science also donated an optical telescope and the Jira Foundation. Now, my parting word, we at the Center for Basic Science, once you give us your idea, we can deliver on a tangible product for you. Thank you and do have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh... We have plus one minute left, so it's okay. We can have, uh, we can entertain one question or two if there's any. I don't see any question in the chat, if I'm not mistaken. We have our friend here, also from your center. No, are you from the same center? No. No, no okay, great. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if you have a question, I have also another question and we'll uh, wrap up. Please okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, that was a very great um, um, presentation and great job that the observatory is actually doing. Um, based on the things that you have just discussed with um, the society. This is amazing um, from, from Nigeria at the Space Center. Um, but I'd like to ask that um, in that particular nation, it looks like we really don't have too much astronomy department in physics department in major universities in the nation. Is the observatory doing one or two things to see that we have more um, the representation or increase in critical mass of astronomer within Nigeria as it were? Okay, like the, the pastor that uh, Dr. Boravetra discussed, he is the director of CBSS and uh, we sponsor uh, PASI, a great uh, volume of money used in sponsoring PASI do come from us. And also, if you say that there are a lot of universities in Nigeria currently running astronomy programs, I can't count them, but I know that there are over seven universities now running astronomy programs up to PhD level. Against we have a University of Nigeria and Soka that started five, uh, in the 60s, doing astronomy in the 60s. 
And uh, we have RDSA University, Federal University of Technology, Ure. Imose University is there, uh, Alfred Babalola University, and a good number of other universities are keying into astronomy. We are not relenting on that. And uh, 2019, we held a symposium at the University of Abuja, trying to encourage them to take interest in astronomy. So we are not relenting on spreading the news of um, astronomy across. Mm. Okay. And also, I'd like you to know that we are also the coordinating office for the West African Regional Office of Astronomy for Development. When we started, we had only about five countries in Warod. Now we have about 11 countries keen into Warod activities. So we are always um, there to help make sure that astronomy is incorporated in not just Nigeria, also in West Africa. Okay, thank you. I don't see any question in the chat, so I'm going to ask my question. Nemeka, I was surprised you mentioned uh, the organ accumulator. Are you meaning really the organ accumulator of William Rich? I mean, what is this uh, device you mentioned that uh, one of the things that you are doing at the Basic Science Center? Organ accumulator. Is that the one yeah. from William Rich? What? No. I Pardon? Don't the, the organ accumulator that you have been building, and it's one of your projects there. Are you really meaning the organ accumulator of William Rich? Or what's, what, what, are, what is it doing? Is it taking yeah, from the energy from the atmosphere and giving to the planet? I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know what Sure, you sure, sure. That's what the organ accumulator does. We put our seedlings inside the accumulator and then charge it from with the cosmic energy from the atmosphere and then plant the, the seedlings. But my friend, I, it is just nothing, no, 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 no meaning, no nonsense in scientific term. Organ has been shown to be just a bunch of baloney. I mean, I really, you read the, read the, the literature about it. It's a William Rich who did it in the 40s, and it's not, it's no science at all. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that you, I mean, I, I wanted, of course, you're not the person behind that, but please, uh, I mean, uh, let us uh, feel that you, it's not the organ accumulator of William Rich, which is just nonsense. I mean, sorry I have to be uh, that brutal, but uh, really, uh, it's, uh, it's not, no sense at all. Maybe from uh, innovative perspective. For if it's a new one, yes. please clarify it. Okay. If it's the old one, it's nonsense. It's uh, you cannot get energy from the atmosphere and bring it to the plants. It's just nonsense. Maybe it's a new. But one. but but these are these are the work we did and we practicalized it. We tried to do a comparison and that is what I showed. I'm not trying to quote what is not obtainable, but I'm quoted what we did. Okay. Is it published work? Has you been not published, published, publishing that not, thing? not yet published. Not okay. yet published. It's an experiment we did practically, not theoretical work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, we thank so okay. Thank you, our speaker. And we go to the next one and the last one of the session. And who is also with us online is Prosperi. Prosperi, you can go ahead. You are talking about the uh, the, re the regional master of science in astronomy and astrophysics. And you have 10 minutes plus five minutes for question and answer. All right, sorry, I was, uh, I was muted. So I was just trying to unmute myself. Uh, greetings to everyone attending the 2022 AFAS conference, uh, both uh, using virtual platform and those colleagues who are attending in person. Uh, my name is uh, Prosper Simpemba. And um, I'm based at the Copper Belt University in Zambia. I'm the regional coordinator for the Southern Africa. Hello? Can you make it full screen so that we can see the whole, uh, your whole screen? I think- You're not able to see my screen? No, the screen that you are showing us from your, from your, yeah, no, not you, you will see it well. The screen, go back to the share screen, screen, screen sharing, but just put, uh, uh, do F5 on your, uh, Documents that we can see the, the your screen the whole as a as a full screen. I mean, you know, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Okay. In the PowerPoint, just do F five so that we can 
have this. Understand? Go back to the PowerPoint. Can you see it now? Can you make it? No. Yeah. Try. Is it fine now? Yes, but try F five. The 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 button F five that we can have the a larger screen of a larger slide as much as possible. Five. Sorry. Presentation mode. Go in presentation mode. I think it's at the bottom. At the bottom right, you'll see. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, miss that one. Yes. Go, go. Is it okay now? No, not yet. Just click harder. Maybe to the slide. Yeah. I, I don't know what is wrong because uh, I'm trying to go into presentation mode. Just go ahead. Just go, go, come quick, uh, go back and uh, I go back. Uh, share the screen again. Okay. We are sharing your face only. We want your face and your screen at the same time. Okay, go ahead. That's you can better. see the screen? It's, it's all right. You just go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, my name is Prosper Simpemba. I'm based at the Copper Belt University in Zambia. I'm the regional coordinator for the Southern African Regional Office of Astronomy for Development. And it's my pleasure to make a presentation at the second AFAS conference. I'll be talking about the proposed regional master of science in astrophysics. So to, when we're preparing this uh, proposed uh, program, we received some contributions from Professor Jan Muti from India, Professor Gordon Gazrai Nyambuya from Zimbabwe, Mr. Daniel Mtambo from Zambia, uh, Professor Priya Hassan from India, and of course, uh, a lot of linkages were done by Professor Vanessa McBride from the OAD South Africa. And this is an MSc in astrophysics. So as to give an, a background to an introduction, we all do understand that astronomy is a challenging basic and fundamental science, which provides an exciting gateway into STEM uh, subjects such as physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. And the universe at large acts as a laboratory for studying matter under unprecedented extremes of energy and density. So our slides, efforts... Sorry, uh, uh, Prosper, uh, we don't see yes, the slides uh, uh, I mean, going, coming in. You know, we're still at the first uh, slide. Oh. They are not moving? No, they are not. That's strange. That's strange. OK, let me stop sharing and share again. Yeah. Um, OK, let me test. Just tell me if it is moving. That's OK. No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I uh, listed the people that present, uh, supported the program and made some contributions. And then um, giving an introduction uh, of astronomy being a challenging uh, basic and fundamental science, uh, which provides an exciting gateway into STEM su subjects. And the universe providing a laboratory for studying matter under unprecedented the extremes of energy and density. So um, we, we have the need to study the faintest uh, celestial bodies. And this need to do this study has led to advanced developments in electronics, optics, and information technology. And also the quest to explore the universe satisfies our deepest cultural and philosophical yearnings 
of our species. And we hope that this should be able to stimulate a sense of global citizenship. The aims and objectives of the proposed Sorry. program. Are, you, are, you are the slides moving? Slides? No, we are still at the second slide. Have you, got, have you moved your slides further? We are still with the names of the participants, the faculty participants. We have not gone further. Yeah. Is yeah, so I'm on the third slide. Can I maybe send to you so that you can move the slide there also? Okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. Um, it's very strange. You are fine. Now we have the, the slides number four or five. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Number four. It's fine. Yeah, we have slide number four. Yes. Okay, that's that's great. Okay, so again, the the program is supposed to provide an education framework in the university, uh, the country and the region leading to professional competence in astrophysics. And it's supposed to give uh, scientific knowledge to the candidates. This should also inculcate in students the research mindedness and awareness that will prepare the students to use the available regional and international research facilities, uh, which we have in the region and beyond. The program is structured uh, as follows. They are, um, there's coursework, so there are courses that are taught, uh, which include mathematical methods for physics, uh, principles of astrophysics, radio and galactic astronomy, uh, stellar physics, computational physics, nuclear and particle physics, atomic, molecular and laser physics, spectroscopic techniques, advanced research methods, astrophysics and electrodynamics. Some of these courses are already being offered at the Copper Belt University. So to this program, only four new courses have been proposed. The principles of astrophysics, radio galactic uh, astronomy, stellar physics, and advanced research methods. The entry requirements for the candidates, these need to have acquired a bachelor's degree in physics or any relevant related field with a minimum score of credit or equivalent. The program is proposed to run for two years. The first year is um, a taught component where they will do courses or coursework. And then the second part is a research component. So the taught courses will be evaluated by an examination, which should be a three hour examination um, paper. And then prior to that, they will have done some continuous assessment like assignments or laboratory work, which will constitute 40%. Then the exam will constitute 60%. Uh, Prosperi, uh, we still have the same problem. You don't seem to be clicking on the right slide. So we are still stuck with the slide number four, I believe. We, don't, we have not gone further. Can you clicking on the slide? Simply the slide. Simply click. click the slide at the left or uh, on the left panel, perhaps to help. Okay, uh, let me try that. No, no, you're right where you are. I mean, if you see the, the left panel, we see the le your left panel, it's the value slides. Just click on the slide at the left panel and it should appear on the main panel. So does it seem to be moving now? No. Maybe you should quickly send uh, us the, the presentation. Is there a solution? Can, can you ask me to share the screen instead of the PowerPoint? Share screen. Sharing your screen, I have an advice. If you could share the screen, not the, the, the PowerPoint presentation. Not Just the window. Share the screen. Uh, so we need Zoom. Yes, we need Zoom. Uh, can go, go to Zoom. Share screen. And then open, then open the and, and open the PowerPoint. Can you see the 
the, the presentation? Yes, uh, yes, it's moving now. That's great. Okay, thanks. That's great. <laughs> no, it stopped. It has stopped again. It's not it stopped. It's great. Stop. T O P. Stop. Presentation. It's fine. Very fine. <laughs> no, my friend. It was great. We just have. We should have left it the way it is. Actually, you're right. Okay. <laughs> so I think I'm now being confused. Are you able to see oh, my presentation? Great. 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 Great or great as you wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry for this uh, slight technical confusion. Uh, you are seeing the slide which has entry requirements. Jama? Yes, yes, indeed. You will see. All it. right. Okay, so I talked about the evaluation of the courses, which will constitute um, uh, the continuous assessment 40%, the examination 60%, the pass mark will be 50%, and um, the student will be expected to pass the research part, the dissertation. Uh, for them to be eligible for graduation. In an event that a, stu a student has failed the course, they will need to resit for that examination at the next regular scheduled examination. The research part will run up to 12 years maximum. Uh, the research will need to be approved by the postgraduate departmental board before the candidate can begin to carry it out. This dissertation will be uh, assessed uh, in two parts. There will be the oral assessment uh, during the Viva VOS when the student presents. This will carry a maximum of 20% uh, max. And then the dissertation report itself, which will carry a maximum of 80% of, of the max. Uh, in addition to this, the candidate will be required to publish at least one paper in a journal or a conference proceedings. Otherwise, they need to show proof of having submitted the paper for publication. So the actual details of the course, uh, this I can share it's in, uh, in Word document. It's also shared on, on Google Drive. So uh, for the purpose of uh, other participants, I can, I can share this uh, in an email later after the presentation. But actually, we are in the process of um, uh, producing online resources um, using the partnership that has been developed between the Internet International Virtual Observatory Alliance and the OAD. Uh, under this uh, program, we anticipate that we are going to host Professor Priya Hassan at the Copper Belt University for a period of at least three months. Uh, who is going to assist in the development of these online resources, as she already has the experience with the IVOA, having worked uh, with the platform for a number of years. So we are still developing a proposal to, to get her moved to CBU this year, and then we hope the program will commence. In conclusion, I need to leave uh, enough time for questions and discussion. The course specialization designed to provide an overview of both the theoretical background and applications of physics in astronomy it can be adopted or adapted by regional higher education institutions. And if this happens, it will make the transfer of credits very easy. So far, we have the support from Mozambique, uh, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prosperi. And uh, we, uh, in fact, we we catch up on the on the, on the delay. But unfortunately, we have to move very quickly. So it is a quick question or two, uh, either from here or from the online. Please go ahead, and we have to really close the session because these other segments which are waiting us uh, waiting for us. Come. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, Prosperi, 
uh, are the people you mentioned you, um, your uh, counselors or are they working with you in designing and uh, making the strategic program? Yeah, so the people that uh, I listed there, we have been working on the document together. Uh, for example, uh, Professor Jan Muti provided a number of uh, suggestions to the courses. Some of the courses that, that are listed there were done by Professor Jan Muti. Uh, Professor Priya Hassan, uh, will be, we, we have discussions to work on the online resources. And of course, uh, Vanessa has been providing all these linkages to, to, to meet up with these people. Then also, um, Gordon Gazrai from Zimbabwe also made significant contributions to the development of the course content. So in a nutshell, this team, we are working together and we, we look forward for other people who want to make a contribution to the program. Yes, a great program indeed. I see a, 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 a hand raised. That would be, in fact, the last question. Mukadi, she, she's a big. Go ahead, uh, ask your question or, or to bring your comment. Uh, uh, put up your comment. Uh, is the research project developed by the university or by the student? Okay, interesting question. So there are two ways. Uh, sometimes you may have. Um, topics proposed by the supervisor, and then the student is given that topic to develop uh, a, a full proposal. Or sometimes a student can come up with an idea, uh, discuss with a potential supervisor and develop a full proposal. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting program. We hope that it will uh, work well and, uh, and even be uh, an example, as you say, for other programs of the same kind in Africa or elsewhere. So we thank again our speaker. Thanks again all the speakers which have been speaking in this session, uh, which have been with, with us online, and we'll follow up don't, for the remaining of the meeting of AFAS uh, tomorrow morning. Bye. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. There's still, of course, a, 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 another session after this, the tea break here, and you, you are, of course, welcome to uh, to end. You should be participating. In fact, Zara is next to me, and she is complaining, saying, "Well, you you eliminated me this easy, uh, in this easy way." So, indeed, in uh, in how many in here, right? Yes, yeah, in in, in in ten minutes. We'll be back and we'll be following up with the other uh, the other speakers. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs>